Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 12.26. You're here at Station 204, so pull up your chair, get your popcorn ready, and we are going to have a fascinating show for you here today because our guest, Kathy Lorini, the president of Osari Space Consulting Group, is with us, and we're going to be talking about international development of space and other things, sort of the side of space flight that you don't really get to hear about very often, but it's still super, super important. So, Kathy, you uh, have quite a background um, with NASA. You have almost four decades of experience uh, with NASA. So that kind of puts you a lot on the on the, the front lines of how space flight works and, and how to do that. And you've done some collaboration as well, uh, working with NASA and other space agencies. Yeah, that's right. I, I, um, I've wor I worked for NASA for my whole career until uh, up until last January where I, when I left and started this consulting company and, and uh, always in the human space flight arena. And, and so that meant I started working on the space shuttle program and then the space station program. And, and both of those programs have an international component. You know, the space shuttle had a, an arm that was provided by the Canadian Space Agency and a, and a laboratory that went in the payload bay that was built in Europe. And the International Space Station is a partnership of, uh, of, uh, of NASA, the Russian Space Agency, the Japanese, European, and Canadian Space Agencies. And it's, it's a very international project. So uh, I really worked, tr worked um, closely with International Space Agencies um, on those major programs. And then the last 10 years of my career, I sort of took the experience working uh, on uh, operational and development side of programs and turned that into a more strategic role, helping work with other space agencies to plan the future of space exploration. So, um, you know, we, we, where will we go? What would we do? Who could contribute what? Those kinds of things. So um, my career is just filled with, um, with interactions with international space agencies and international players. And you led the development of something called the Global Exploration Roadmap, which was done by a massive collaboration of space agencies. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that activity was born when the Constellation program was canceled. And Constellation was a, a program that um, the second president, George Bush, uh, started to take astronauts back to the moon and then on to Mars. And, and when President Obama came into office, he canceled the program, but he kept alive the, the transportation system, basically, because we can talk about this later today, but you know, there's, there's a rationale for, for space agencies now to start pushing beyond low Earth orbit to the moon and, and on to Mars. And so um, when the Constellation program was canceled, um, we kind of knew at NASA that we were going to explore and we wanted international partners. Um, and, but we didn't know where we were going to go. You know, we, for a while we thought maybe asteroids, then Mars, but you know, the global exploration roadmap was about, um, working with interested space agencies to talk about what were the challenges and opportunities about going beyond low earth orbit. And, um, and how would we how would we accomplish it? So so there were 15 space agencies, and we we talked about our goals and objectives. You know, we wanted to be sure we had a uh, you know a, a a common enough set of goals and objectives that would make uh, such a roadmap possible. And we found that we did. Um, and then we talked about given our goals and objectives, what kind of architectures would we need to um, to realize them? You know, what would we need to build? What kind of transportation systems or habitation systems or science type technologies would we need? And then um, given that we still had a lot of work to do to get these capabilities developed, we talked about how we could collaborate with each other in the preparatory work. You know, how could we leverage our investment in technologies, for example? How could we... Um, uh, coordinate in addressing the human health challenges associated with these future missions. So the idea was, while we prepared for this future, what could we do today to, to leverage all of our investments? Because everybody who participated in that activity knew that it was too, it was too big for any one agency to do on their own, too expensive. 
and there's a lot of benefits of doing it together. Um, and so it made sense to talk about how to leverage our, our investments. So it was really a strategic planning roadmap exercise. Um, it, it was used by NASA to demonstrate that we were engaging with international space agencies, but it was also used by the international space agencies to um, help build support for space exploration in their countries. So it was a pretty successful um, product, and it still it still still serves as sort of the the roadmap of what uh, what space agencies are thinking. So Elias nineteen eighty one in our YouTube channel um, is asking. What are the short term and the long term goals? And it kind of sounds like in the short term, there's a immediacy of collaboration and sort of like a, a narrowing of focus as to here's what we would like to be at. Um, so is there anything else in the short term that kind of came out of that? And then also, as Elias was asking, what about the long term goals out of that as well? Okay, yeah, I'm going to start with the long term goal. So I'd say the, the long term goal is a is, a, is exploring Mars together, um, uh, enabling humanity to extend its presence to Mars and live and work on Mars. And, and that's, a, that's a common long-term goal, but that's, um, it's gonna take some you know, technology and, and capabilities that we don't have today. So in the near term though, the priority is, I'd say building a, a sustainable endeavor. You know, what we saw when President Obama became president and he canceled the Constellation program, and we saw in the past, you know, the impact of, 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 of politicians and changes of administrations, changes in governments. And we saw that that, you know, doesn't, that kind of behavior doesn't really enable a lot of progress in a multi-decadal effort. So the near-term goal is really to try to figure out what would make human um, expansion into the solar system, you know, going first to the moon and then on to Mars and beyond, what would make it sustainable and sustainable in the sense that governments will continue to support it, continue to pay for it over the years, right? So um, what, so that defining a sustainable endeavor, I would say is the, is the priority, but within that, that means, you know, engaging the science community to understand what are the near-term science priorities, um, engaging the, um, the private sector who's thinking about um, uh, extending the Earth's economy to the area around the moon. You know, people talk about mining the moon. People talk about harvesting the water ice for propellant generation on the moon. Um, people talk about, you know, tourism around the moon. So there's, there's some excitement in um, in, in, a, in a lunar economy. So what's the role of space agencies? What can we do with our first steps to, what can they do? I, I need to get out of the habit of talking like I still work for NASA because I don't, but um, what can be done to um, enable the, the, um, uh, the, the economy to, um, to grow there and to thrive there? Um, you know, what kind of partnerships do need to be um, developed both international and commercially to uh, to enable a sustainable endeavor. So, so I would say that's the near term priority of NASA and the other space agencies. Yeah, and in our YouTube chat room, Lisa Stojanowski is asking, how do private companies fit into the roadmap? Uh, and I feel like that's a really good question because when Constellation started, uh, SpaceX was only two years old at that time. Um, and then when Constellation was wrapped up as well, SpaceX hadn't even flown a Falcon 9 yet. Uh, so how do, how do those private companies come into play in this roadmap? So the in the roadmap, um, we talked a lot about how the existence of the private company interest should uh, influence government planning and government actions, government spending, right? Um, you know, governments spend public money, so they need to do it for a broad public good. You know, the government money is not supposed to, you know, enable Elon Musk to be successful, for example, but, but the presence of SpaceX, um, uh, and 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 Blue Origin and and all the other companies that are um, uh, working on capabilities, lunar robotic 
little, little um, lunar robots, for example, robotic missions, robotic landers, um, and they provide opportunities for coordination. So there's a consensus among space agencies that this is a great opportunity to, um, to collaborate, to look for um, common interests in uh, and common goals and, and ways to collaborate. Um, um, and so the, the, and you see NASA doing more of that, right? You see NASA um, as they think about going to the moon together with international partners, uh, the first step is, is establishing this small gateway around the moon. And, and so the approach has been, the approach of NASA has been, um, you know, who else has, reasons to be in this area that we might be able to partner in the development of the gateway or in the um, in the use of the gateway. And, and in fact, the first element of the gateway is a partnership between NASA and a private company, um, Maxar, who, who is interested in testing out um, solar electric propulsion technology, a bus that they would use for other applications, perhaps uh, geo satellites or other applications, and and um, and this provides an opportunity for NASA to invest some money and get um, get a, a a capability out of it that they would have paid a lot more for if they had done it through traditional acquisition methods. So um, that's an example of how the existence of these private companies wanting to do things in the area around the moon creates opportunities. So going back specifically to um, to, to SpaceX and Blue Origin, who both have, are both sort of millionaire, billionaire funded companies, right? Um, that are interested in seeing a vision develop and not wanting to pay for the entire vision themselves because it is so cost prohibitive, but, but willing to say, hey, we're, we're willing to put um, a lot of our own money into realized capabilities that would help you space agencies also achieve your goals. So let's talk about ways to um, ways to facilitate that. So um, the the interest in 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 uh, in exploration beyond low Earth orbit is is a is is very interesting in um, in in the planning for space exploration. I will say it's even more um, uh, you know transformational in low Earth orbit where the space station is. You know, um, NASA has, and in the International Space Station partners have been operating the ISS for, for over 20 years. And they have, um, and through all that, those investments, you know, bought down a lot of risk and developed a lot of the key technologies. So to the point where we can envision private companies building crew transportation capabilities, right? Like the commercial crew activity that NASA is funding that the, the test flights will hopefully be before the end of this year. Um, uh, but also the commercial cargo and, and NASA is looking at um, commercial modules on the space station and commercial free flying modules, all with the realization that, you know, low earth orbit doesn't need to be a government dominated domain anymore. It's really ready to, to, to be a, a, a um, you know, a, a, a market-driven, um, you know, a market-driven sphere. So, so NASA, it's, it's not quite there yet in that the the demand for these commercial services um, is still a little bit soft, but the commercial service providers are, are raring to go and perfectly capable of developing everything that you need to do research in low-Earth orbit. So I think we'll see um, as as we see a um, economy flourishing around humans and their infrastructure in low Earth orbit, we'll see more players that bring more private sector money and capabilities to the table that can help um, space agencies think about going beyond as well. So um, you know, and, and I, I have to think that you know an economy in low Earth orbit is a precursor to one around the moon, um, just because you know it, it's it's. Transportation costs are significant, and and it's there to get to low Earth orbit. They're even more so to get to to the moon. So, um, you know, the, the 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 visions that the Elon Musk's and the Jeff Bezos's have really depend on you know a, an economy um, to keep supporting it, and um, and so you know both they they and governments are, are hoping to enable that. And and like I said, everybody thinks that the low earth orbit were, were on the verge and, and hopefully the area around the moon will follow shortly thereafter. 
So with international collaboration, is that something that is essential to getting humans beyond low Earth orbit? Um, or can a country do something solo? Um, I will, from, from everything that I, um, you know, I've worked extensively on that. I've seen Russian detailed studies of what it would take and the Russians concluded they couldn't do it on their own. Um, the, the, the Chinese, they know they can't do it on their own. Um, not because they don't have the technology, but it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money because it's not just developing the ability to get there. It's also doing meaningful things when you're there, right? So that drives you to have the capability to support people there and, and help them be productive. So, um, so I am convinced, and I believe there's a consensus around the world that, that, um, nobody can do it alone. It's just too, too expensive. And, you know, there's also other benefits to doing it together, right? You, you, if you look at the Apollo program and how, um, you know, we were reminded recently with the, with the, what, 50th anniversary that, um, you know, that Apollo was an, was an achievement for the world, not just for the U.S. We certainly beat the, the Russians, beat the Soviets, but, but it was celebrated um, all around the world as humanity's triumph. And, and, and that's certainly what going back to the moon and, and onto Mars will be um, uh, once we do that. So, um, you know, let's bring the best of what everybody has in terms of technologies and ideas and, and pool our resources and, and, and do it. Um, I think to, to do to, it's the only way it can be, uh, um, a meaningful enough, um, endeavor to be sustainable. And Johnny Spacer on YouTube has a really cool question um, that sort of uh, sort of hits at the early days of the space race uh, with it, which is, could we do something akin to the International Geophysical Year, like having an international Mars year that would kick off a coordinated international effort to send humans to Mars? Is that something that would maybe work out particularly better than just asking for that collaboration? Um, no, it's, I think it's a great idea, right? Because it is a, it's a forcing function and it, um, it helps provide a framework for people to think about how they might fit in, you know, and people have thought about that in terms of a lunar international lunar, um, geophysical year. Um, so it's been proposed, I think by the national space society. Um, but I, I happen to think it's a good idea and, and anything that can, you know, leverage, um, you know, non-traditional, um, you know, people and communications methods and, you know, frameworks to, 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 you know, get, get, get something so ambitious planned, I think is a good idea. And, you know, with international collaboration, I would imagine that there are some difficulties that can come with that. You know, it's just like a band when they come together to record an album, everybody sort of wants their own thing, and there's a little bit of a give and take that happens in that in order to actually make that album occur. So what, what from your perspective, having actually been involved in, in international cooperation, um, what are some of the big challenges that, that happen when you move to a collaborative mission? Um. I'm going to talk a little bit about when we brought the Russians into the International Space Station program, because I think that provides some good examples of, <laughs> of um, the clash of cultures. You know, the Russians had been operating space stations all, already. Um, they had Salyut and they had Mir, and, um, and the U.S. had, had uh, Skylab and the space shuttle. And um, and we had with with the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Canadians already initiated the space station program and started to plan. and And it was in the early '90s when um, the decision was made to approach the Russians and see if they wanted to participate. Um, and the geopolitical reasons, I think, are probably known to this audience. But um, when the two programs came together, the Russians had been operating space stations, right? And and the 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 NASA-led effort hadn't. And we had our own approaches to solving problems. They had their own approaches to solving problems. I remember when we had some early meetings on how we were planning what we were gonna do to, um, to um, uh, do science on the space station. 
you know, we, we wanted to start the planning, you know, years before they, they thought, you know, they knew that, you know, if you start something that early, it's going to change. And, you know, so don't waste your time. Don't start planning that until it's closer to actually being executed. And, and, and they were right. And, and, and they also have, um, if you talk about hardware, they have, have this simple approach to, to, to providing a function. You know, we had, uh, all sorts of bells and whistles and, uh, you know, and automation and alarms. And they, they have basic, simple ways of getting the job done um, that are reliable and, um, and, uh, and safe. So we, we learned from each other, really, um, you know, the benefits of both approaches, you know, um, so, so, so that was good. Um, you know, the, 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 the language and other cultural type barriers are, um, are things that, that you see. Um, um, but there are more, I'd say, challenges to be overcome. You know, we, we agreed early on that, that English would be the language um, on the space station and the Russians came and they, they didn't want to speak English and they wanted to speak Russian because there, there's not enough English speakers in their control centers and in their programs and projects. So, so really, their their cosmonauts had to learn some English, and our astronauts had to learn some Russian. Um, and on board, you know, every crew has their own their own um, you know habits that they that they fall into. Um, uh, and and food, you know, the you want to your the Russians want their typical you know Russian food, and and others you know want their their comfort food, you know, the Japanese want their, their the food that they, that they like. So figuring out ways to build menus that can, um, that can satisfy everybody. So, so there's all sorts of, of, of issues from, um, you know, the, the, the small little ones, um, uh, to, to bigger ones, but the, that's the success of the program that everybody has, has found a way to address them and, 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 and to thrive. So, um, I think if you ask people on you know on on in any of the space agencies participating in the in the international space station program um they will tell you that that they've learned a lot through this collaboration and it's been very positive so lisa in our chat room on youtube is asking about the international space exploration coordination group asking if it's like uh the un for space um and i kind of want to throw in too like asking like is this how we make starfleet actually end up happening uh, with that, so so what's a what's sort of the background a little bit about the International Space Exploration Coordination Group? Yeah, so the the International Space Exploration Coordination Group was formed in two thousand and seven, and it's it's a space agency coordination group, right? It's where space agencies that are interested in um, in space exploration that are investing in space exploration and interested in collaborating with other space agencies can join and, and have a dialogue. Um, they, in the group, space agencies talk about all sorts of things from, you know, the road mapping, the global exploration road mapping effort that I described earlier, but there's, there's other things. They, they work on um, a common view of the benefits, right? What we found early on in the 2007 through uh, 12 timeframe was it, Space agencies needed help explaining to their governments what were the benefits of investing in in space exploration. So, so, so agencies coordinated on a prod on a product that's called the Benefits White Paper. So, it's an agency coordination forum. Now, it's not a program management forum. So, it's not it's voluntary. Its decisions are um, are not binding, um, and so it's not really. Uh, a governance mechanism for for space exploration. So it's not really a um, you know an international organization that would manage space exploration. And some people have called for for a, an international organization to manage it. Um, and uh, you know I can see the benefits of it, but coming from the U.S., where we're such a dominant investor in the capabilities, right? Um, it's hard to imagine giving control over something um, to an international group when you are by far the largest shareholder. You know what I mean? So I think if we get to the point where a number of space agencies around the world are significantly investing and such a, a, a an international 
governance m mechanism makes sense. But until then, um, I think it would be hard to get the attention of, of the biggest investors um, to do something like that, right? You know, because you're basically ceding control. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Europe and I watch how the European Space Agency works. And it's, um, it's what, 22 member states now, something like that. They've been growing in the last 10 years. But the, the process of, of preparing decisions and taking decisions is, is really laborious. And, you know, once they take one, they, they stick to it and that's nice, but it, it's a long time to get there. So, you know, you, you trade, um, you know, some agility, you trade, um, you trade, uh, uh, you know, some efficiency um, by going to a, a multi, a multilateral, you know, uh, governing body. Um, that said, if, if a lot of people are investing, they're going to want more control over how things go and they should, they deserve it. So, um, uh, you know, I think if there's a, a massive migration of, of humans into the, into the, um, into space and it's managed by governments, then, um, then something like a, uh, you know, whether it's UN or not, or something like a, you know, uh, an international organization to manage it makes sense. Um, but as long as it's exploration and, um, you know, the funding is, is really significantly provided by the U S then I don't, I don't see it happening. So the, uh, Lisa also has a really good question too, which is talking about the original roadmap that was written, um, by that group. It was done a few years ago. So how do countries new to space like Australia, um, or even a country like Luxembourg, which is doing a lot of sort of econ more aimed towards economic development of space. Um, how do they end up contributing if they're fresh on the scene? Oh yeah, that's a great question because, um, uh, I watched like the Australians and the UAE, for example, they're new to the game, um, come into the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. And the, re the roadmap, the first version of the roadmap was released in 2011. It was updated in 2013. So these are space agencies that came in in the lead up to the most recent um, roadmap, which was which was released early last year. And. Um, you know, they are, um, you know, they, they were watching space agencies that have a lot of experience in space operations and, and space exploration robotically and even um, um, a lot of human spaceflight experience. They're watching a lot of agencies that have done a lot of things in space with a lot of um, capabilities and, and, um, and expertise and, and people. And, and what they were really trying to do by participating was look for a, a niche that they could play, right? What could they do to help contribute to a global effort? So um, the, uh, I'll use both the, both the Australians and, and the United Arab Emirates participated in the ISEG to understand what, what other space agencies were doing. And they used that to inform their, their technology investments with the idea that investing in certain technologies would then lead them to the ability to develop capabilities that would be um, would be useful to the global effort. So um, they they each went through a very um, impressive systematic effort to develop their own technology roadmaps. Um, in fact, you can find both what the UAE did and and Australian Space Agency did. Um, I think the Australian one was done by CSIRO. But um, you can find those online, I think. And, and um, both of the, their efforts were informed by participating in the ISEG. Um, so um, that was good. You know, if you take another, another space agency like the Chinese, you know, the Chinese participate in ISEG, and, but they came in with a different, a different motivation. You know, they were um, uh, investing in, in, some robotic missions, but they were building a, a space station in low Earth orbit, right? They're, as soon as they get their Long March 5 working, they'll start deploying the space station. And they are um, their goal in participating in ISEG was to let people know that they were working on these capabilities, share a little bit more information that was shared publicly. They didn't share much more than was shared publicly, but a little bit. And, and let everybody know they wanted cooperation. They were um, they wanted collaboration. And so 
um, that was their goal, um, both in low Earth orbit with their space station. They were welcoming um, agencies to contribute capabilities for their space station or or in science experiments for their space station. And as they as they thought in the future of going to the moon, you know, they envisioned you know, a future where we can be more collaborative as agencies um, doing human exploration. So maybe we can think of ways to to cooperate. You know, there are some restrictions that are um, pretty strong in the U.S. about working bilaterally with the Chinese and, and other space agencies around, around the world have concerns about, you know, technology transfer um, that prevent too much. But, you know, in, in the future where um, China is better um, able to protect and respect other people's technology than, um, then, you know, they can bring a lot to the table in a collaboration. And, and I'm sure everybody else that participated in ISEG was, was hoping in the International Space Exploration Coordination Group was hoping that we would get to that future because the, the capabilities that they could bring would really be, um, would really be, uh, would really strengthen the overall effort. And Stella Ford in our YouTube chat room uh, is actually asking a really interesting question, uh, which is about the newer, uh, na sort of the, the newer national space agencies, um, but also, you know, sort of talking about a standalone commercial market as well. Um, you know, how long do you think until uh, that commercial market's going to be there? And also, do you think that these newer national space agencies are kind of getting a little bit of an edge on it since they're coming in with that already in place? Um, I would say no. There's nobody better at working with the private sector than NASA, frankly. Um, NASA is, is leading the way on ways to do it and and what to do and you know the newer space agencies are seeing it and welcoming it and and learning from it and that's great that's great um and it will it will help them get to the point where they can make significant contributions quicker so that's that's super um i think um when will a standalone market um exist. I mean, like I said, I think, I think Leo is the first, low earth orbit is the first place where we'll see it. And, um, you know, the, 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 a great place to watch is to gauge that is, you know, the international space station and the, um, and the, um, the efforts on board to use the space station by private companies. Right. So uh, when NASA the first um, really made, once the assembly was finished of the space station, NASA made a big push to um, um, comp private companies to do research on the space station, you know, um, biomedical companies and, and um, consumer products companies, people that, you know, um, that were, that offered products that, um, you know, taking microgravity out of the equation would help you learn about a fundamental physics principle and how it impacted, you know, your, your product. Um, and and so they they enticed a number of, of of private companies to do work on the space station, but they're they're still, you know, in the beginning it was NASA really still trying to figure out how to um, how to um, make the environment uh, more friendly to the private sector, and and, it, and it's something NASA has been working hard on for the last five years. And as they do that, you know, they realize that. Um, you know, not every I has to be dotted and T has to be crossed and everything has to be risk free. Um, they, they end up creating an environment that's more uh, more friendly to private sector use and experimentation in space. And so I think, um, you know, from what I'm seeing and hearing from groups like the ISS National Lab um, coming out of the Space Station um, Research and Development Conference that just took place in July, the latest one, um, there's a lot of new great ideas for for things to be done in space around humans and their infrastructure. And so, um, you know, people are saying that the market for this Leo um, uh, this Leo economy will be um, multifaceted. Right? There'll be governments will want to purchase. Um, the ability to do um, to do research and test technologies and get their astronauts some experience before sending them beyond low Earth orbit. So that'll be probably the biggest part of the market. There will be um, still be private companies, whether they're biomedical or consumer products or others, who want to 
um, do research, basic research in, in, in microgravity, or maybe even produce things in microgravity. Um, and there'll be other, other people that want to just produce things. You know, there's, there's a company that tried um, to produce an optical fiber and with the idea that if you can produce it in space, it will be a lot more efficient. And, um, and they're working on that. There's other companies in the biomedical arena that are thinking about how you could actually manufacture things of use in space. And, um, and, and so that's, that would be a key in space manufacturing will be a key part of the, the economy. Tourism will be a part of the economy. Advertising will be a part of the economy. So there's enough things that, you know, taken together, um, I believe, you know, later next decade, we'll see the ISS being retired. Um, I think the ISS will be retired, not because it's, you know, knock on wood, because it, it's, it's stopped working, but because there's already, uh, you know, alternatives up there and, and the governments don't want to compete. So, so, so the ISS will be retired then. So I would, I would say, you know, mid next decade, later next decade, for sure, we'll see, we'll see low earth orbit, um, really as a, as a, um, vibrant commercial market. And having worked on the front lines of international collaboration, uh, what is that like for you? What was that like for you? Um, I'm sure there was like lots of cultural differences and lots of uh, uh, differences in, in desired outcomes. Uh, so what was that like personally to be working with that and, and trying to enable that? Um, I mean, it was fascinating because you, you get exposure to so many things that are are just um uh, amazing uh it was it was wonderful i'd say you know in order to be effective an effective leader in a multicultural environment like uh, like i had to i had to be um you need to understand each of the other space agencies and and you know understand the people and understand what the space agency's priorities were understand how they made their decisions you know it would be useless for me to you know, to suggest we make a decision on a point at the next meeting, if I knew, you know, several agencies had a lot of things to do before they would be in a position to make a, make a decision. So you had to understand how they, how they made decisions. Um, and, and, um, and, and getting to know the people was also just was fascinating. And, and, and I think when you, when you, um, if you do it right, you can create an environment where people are free to throw out their ideas. You know, it's easy when, you've got a NASA badge on and you're leading to think that, you know, you know, everything, you know, the best way to do it. But um, what I tried to do was say, you know, Hey, here's the, here's the 70% solution. Here's what we think, but we're open to your, your good ideas. And, and so we talk it through and, and, and good ideas always came up from, from the international. So, um, you know, just recognizing that uh, it's it's just the you know just the reason why diversity is so important and talked about a lot in 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 you know in in organizational behavior now and uh, is is the same thing you know when you get a diverse group of people and cultures together um, they they look at a problem differently and and good ideas come from it so I, I really enjoyed it and 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 you know you got it i got a chance to visit uh, so many different places um you know all over the world where space agencies were based but also um you know there's a, a international um astronautical congress that's held every year in a new place and and the organizers of this are often trying to stimulate interest in in space to other parts of the world where it may not be so so interesting so there was one in in cape town south africa several years ago. And, and that was, that was fascinating just a chance to see something so different and so, uh, so interesting. So I, I, I derived a lot of personal satisfaction from, you know, getting to know the people and the, and the cultures both work and, 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 you know, their country cultures and, and then trying to work together to solve problems. So during your international collaboration, what was the best way that you ended up solving those problems? What, uh, what worked best with all the other countries working together in order to push ideas forward? Yeah, I, I talked about it. Um, I talked about it just a second ago, but uh, let me go a little bit deeper. But you, what I found was, um, you know, in this group, there were a lot of space agencies. And as one of the previous commenters noted, you know, some are newer space agencies that don't have the history and the expertise. So um, 
they are um, they're participating in a group activity for for their own reasons to help inform their you know their growth their prioritization their developing program so so you had a different group and then you had other people that were operating the space station and you know they knew all about space so what I found is um, the best way to approach something was to you know recognize that if you started out with a group that was so um, so desperate, so, so, you know, widely varying. If you start out with a clean sheet of paper, um, you get nowhere because some, you know, the beginning of an activity, say you want to, you want to write paper on what, want to write a white paper on the benefits of space exploration, or you want to develop a roadmap, or you want to, um, uh, you know, do a technology mapping exercise, whatever. Um, you know, you start out from the beginning, you've got to figure out you know, where are you? Where do you want to go? What is the process? What does the product look like? How should you get there? And, and all along the way, um, if you start out with a blank sheet of paper, there's questions and, and um, uh, you know, ideas thrown out. And it's just really hard to converge a, a, a large group. It's, it's impossible. So what I, what I tried to do was um, working with my NASA team and sometimes with a smaller set of agencies, right? To, I would I would work to prepare if, if we decided to do something I would work to prepare you know the you know the the fifty percent solution or the you know you know an idea give give people something to shoot at right it's better than starting out with uh, with a blank sheet of paper so you know we're gonna go do X Y Z and here's what it might look like what do you think and then we could talk about whether what I had proposed or or the team I'd asked to propose something had proposed and. And, you know, how does that help? And, and, and how does that, um, you know, wh where does it fall short? And, and, and if you were open to, um, you know, to accommodating the good ideas that in, you know, always came from that discussion, the product would be, would be excellent and better, stronger at the end. So, um, so I, I think, you know, advice I would give, give your, your listeners is, is just recognize that, um, you know, if, if you want to, international product you need to value everybody's input but um don't be afraid to you know to take the lead in guiding um in guiding the discussion um uh, with some specifics but 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 be open to comments and and change along the way and, from and where our, it will go. yeah so from our youtube uh chat lisa stojanovsky is asking uh what was your favorite idea or solution that came out of those meetings where you or NASA took a step back and listened uh, to what that collaborator may have said. What was your favorite thing? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite is it's an easy one. Um, it's a, and it's a great question. But during the constellate during the constellation program days, that's when when the International Space Exploration Group Coordination Group started, and um, NASA had engaged this group to help lay out um, a plan for exploring the moon. You know, those of you that remember Constellation may remember that, um, that NASA was uh, providing the entire transportation system to the lunar surface. So the rocket that would launch the cargo and, and the crew and the lander. And, and we were not open to international collaboration on those capabilities, which I believe was a mistake. But we were open to collaboration in lunar surface exploration, and 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 NASA's baseline plan was to um, start out with some sortie missions. So these were seven-day missions to different places on the moon, and then um, after a few years, start building an outpost in one location at the at the South Pole. We were going to build a, a massive outpost, and that was the plan. And um, and so we, our goal in starting the international discussions was to introduce these plans to the other space agencies and begin a discussion about who wanted to contribute what. And in the process of that discussion, um, the, the, one of the international working groups in, inside this effort came up with this idea of extended stay missions. So the idea was to, um, uh, basically not go for seven days to some place, but in place a pressurized rover 
and um, and allow the crew to stay for 40, 42 days, a lunar day, a lunar night, and then another lunar day in one location. And so that was called, an, we called them extended stay missions. And then the rover would move, when the crew wasn't there, the rovers would move to a different location. And then the astronauts would come and, and, um, and land at this new location and explore this new location for another extended stay mission. And, um, and we brought this back to NASA management, you know, and the NASA administrator at the time, Mike Griffin was very married to the constellation plan and, and uh, the program manager for constellation was Jeff Hanley. And, um, and we brought this, this, these ideas that came out of this discussion with the partners to Jeff and to Mike Griffin um, and told them how excited we were about the ideas and, and they agreed. So NASA was in the process of changing our approach to exploring the moon um, because of these ideas that came out of the international discussions. Now, the Constellation program got canceled, but, but those basic ideas stuck with the international community. And you still see that architecture in the, um, in the latest global exploration roadmap. The idea now of space agencies is to, um, um, is to have that capability to do these uh, extended mission, extended stay missions. Um, and, 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 you know, how many you do depends on, you know, if you build an outpost and where and when, um, but, um, uh, those types of missions were, there's a lot of good reasons for, for them, including science and, and advancing technologies that you need for Mars, um, allowing a lot of agents, a lot of different space agencies to contribute, to play a big role. So, um, uh, it was an idea that came from the international discussions and has sort of stuck with the community. And, you know, uh, to kind of talk about Constellation a little bit, because you played a pretty good role in Constellation. You were, uh, <laughs> you were literally the project manager of the Altair lander uh, for Constellation. Um, so that's, that's pretty high up uh, for that there. I know, that was pretty fun. Yeah, and uh, Lisa in our chat room uh, is sort of asking, you know, tell us more about why you think Constellation was canceled. But also just if you tell us a little more about, like, what was it like to work on Constellation at that time as well? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, it was it was fantastic. Um, you know, it was um, you know just to provide a little bit of context, right? Um, uh, in two thousand and three, we lost the space shuttle Columbia when when it was coming back um, after a successful mission, and and there was a commission that was formed to study it and make some recommendations on what happened and. And one of the discussions that started after the findings of this commission were, were that, hey, you know, um, uh, uh, really space is becoming a more mature of a domain. Even at this point in time, there were, um, you know, Elon Musk was starting to talk about building rockets and, um, and people were imagining, you know, a, a private commercial you know, a commercial space, you know, uh, commercial space push. Um, and so, uh, and that was embraced by the, a lot of the, you know, many in the community um, at the time. So um, Constellation, um, Constellation was sort of a recognition that, you know, in the past people, presidents have had ideas will go beyond low earth orbit. Even after Apollo, there were proposals to go, do more on the moon and go to Mars. Werner von Braun was proposing Mars, but um, you know, so so there were proposals in the past, but but now was the time to start getting serious about it, right? Now is the time to start seriously planning about beyond low Earth orbit work. So Constellation started um, in that in that in that context, and um, and um, the idea was to build a a rocket that could take. And, and, and you know, one of the other things that happened after after the Columbia accident was the the recommendation to retire the space shuttle, and and so the um, we started planning with Constellation to be able to deliver astronauts to the space station as well as this whole Moon Mars program, uh, and um, it was it, you know it was a fantastic time because the Apollo astronauts were were you know were still, and, and many people that had worked on Apollo were still, um, you know, able to remember and provide lessons learned. So there was a lot of work, um, you know, going back through all the Apollo data and how they made decisions and 
why they were so successful and and what could what lessons could we learn from it? A lot of people talk to people that built spacecraft. You know, some of my guys talk to the Northrop Grumman guys that built the LEM module for for Apollo. And um, you know, I got to be in a meeting, I chair a meeting with Neil Armstrong and and um, Jack Schmidt and and Gene Cernan and John Young to talk about a particular issue that we were facing that they also had. So there was that excitement about, you know, now we're passing the torch to a new generation and we're going to go to the moon. And this time we're going to go to stay and then we're going to go on to Mars. So there was that excitement too, that was, was really, um, was really nice. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and it was well-funded. The agency, um, the agency um, did a lot of shuffling of, of money to make room for Constellation. And that turned out to be not such a smart idea, right? When, you, when you've got an agency that has, you know, a healthy science program and an aeronautics program and a human spaceflight program and, and, and they're kind of balanced, not equally, but, you know, e- you know uh, let's say in, in a symbiotic relationship, um, when you disturb the the apple cart, then people get unhappy. You know, f- stakeholders get unhappy, and that created some problems for Constellation. And then, um, you know, just the typical challenges of 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 developing these capabilities um, after so long a time of um, you know not really um, having development teams. You know, the shuttle was pretty mature by then, so you know the d- the design and development of a major human spaceflight system. Um, is is a big endeavor. So there were, you know, you know, NASA was kind of rusty, and um, and uh, and and um, so was I would argue the contractor base. So um, costs rose, and so when you combine the 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 um, the rising costs with the the uncertain the unhappiness of various stakeholder groups. Um, it provided uh, an opportunity for the, the Obama administration to say, look, let's step back and, and do things differently. And, and at the time, basically, the Obama administration was was really looking to fund, you know, by now the commercial space uh, um, effort was 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 roaring. You know, Lori Garver was um, the, the deputy administrator, um, and she was very strong pushing for commercial space activities. And so and, and public private partnerships and getting, changing the role of NASA. And so, um, you know, the administration, you know, had this desire to push commercially and, and public private partnerships and they, in an environment where, you know, there were a lot of, you know, people that lost when Constellation took their budget and, and rising costs of Constellation. So just, um, uh, you know, I believe those are the main factors that, that, um, that caused the program to end. I will say it was such a shock wave to the community um, because so much money had been spent at the time it was canceled on, you know, the Ares rocket and the Orion and the Ares five, a little bit of money had been spent, uh, um, a little bit of money on the Altair lander had been spent, but, but a lot of money had been spent uh, across the board. And, um, and, you know, that's a lot of money. A lot of money was, was really wasted, I would say, um, with that big decision. So it was nice to see when the, this current administration came that they didn't make the huge changes that um, previous administrations had done, saying, hey, you know, just because it was the previous guy's idea, I don't like it, so let's cancel it. So it allowed us to stay sort of on a steady path, um, which, which was very good. So, um, but Constellation was, was great. It was, it was fun to be part of going back to the moon. We were attracting, you know, young people out of college, the brightest, and they were so excited. And, um, and, and so everybody was, so it, it was, it was a lot of fun. And to kind of, uh, wrap up our, our amazing discussion that we've had so far today, um, what does the future of international collaboration look like? And, is there a seat at that table for like a specific private company that may want to be c- considered as an international collaborator with that? So what does that future look like? Oh yeah, definitely. So the future is, um, I think NASA's got a great plan um, right now going, building the gateway, going back to the surface of the moon and, and then on to Mars. And they are working with international space agencies 
you know, the ISS partners to, to build the gateway. Ah, oh, yeah, there's the, the chart from the roadmap. So this is a great, this is, a, this is really what everybody's working on. So, you know, let's get, let's get low earth orbit ready for the future platforms. And, um, and then, and let space agencies push beyond low earth orbit, but doing it together with, with um, partners from the from the private sector, so um, the both the gateway and lunar surface activities will have, um, if if NASA successful, you know, significant international partnerships, both the traditional space agencies and new space agencies. Um, through this work that we did in the global exploration roadmap, a lot of space agencies are busy working on on capabilities and having discussions with NASA um, that are really productive, leading to. You know, leading to collaborations on the on the lunar surface, um, and uh, and so then that will just strengthen the international partnership um, um, with more more nations, and then um, at the right time, agencies will lead the push to go to, to Mars. So I think that um, and and agencies are very you know they see the benefits of 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 the part private public private partnerships um, and and so that will ensure that um, significant public sector entities that are investing and and want to see things happen and are 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 um, uh, are um, you know have a have a stake in the game will have a seat at the table in uh, in 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 the planning and execution of of the mission so um, I think it'll be really a future of of, of, of exploration with international and private sector partners. And I really hope that, uh, that we can uh, stay on track and, and get it done. I hope we can get humans to the surface of the moon by, by 2024 uh, or shortly thereafter. And I hope that um, that will lead to a, a real, they'll do it in a way that, that is sustainable, that will have international partners in significant ways, do good science and, um, you know, and, and enable the, private sector to meet their needs as well. So, um, so the whole, so, so it's a, it's a sustainable effort. All right. Well, Kathy Lorini, the president of Asari uh, <laughs> Space Consulting Group, a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk about international collaboration. So fantastic to have well, you. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. I and really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it's great to get that out there and kind of get that inside perspective too on something that we really don't think about very often um, in spaceflight, that international collaboration. And also with international collaboration, you, the viewers, help do that for us as well here at Tomorrow. We are a show that is essentially funded by you, the viewer. Uh, you can reach certain levels with us if you'd like to and get certain things um, for that. So like our escape velocity citizens that we have right here, our orbital citizens, you get access to some really cool stuff. And if you'd like to help fund the shows of tomorrow, you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And also, now you can do it on YouTube as well. You can go to youtube.com slash tmro slash join. And for as little as a dollar per month, you can help support us and help make these shows possible. Because we can't have the studio, we can't have all this amazing equipment, and we can't get these amazing connections with these people without your help. So if you'd like to help financially, those are ways you can do it. You could also head over to community.tmro.tv as well in order to find other ways you can help us out and also do that as well. So thanks for watching Orbit 12.26. Until the next episode, we'll see you later. Bye-bye, everybody.